Hey there. In this video, we'll be taking a look at the dynamic range of the R5 and comparing it against the R7 and the C70. Since the version 1.6.0 firmware came out for the R5, I've been curious about whether or not the dynamic range has been increased. And I did mention this in the video I made about the R5 firmware update. When the R5C came out, it was clear that it had more dynamic range than the R5. I was kind of hoping maybe there's better dynamic range in the R5 because it was kind of a big update that they just put out. So in this video, as I said, I will get into testing the dynamic range of the R5 and comparing it with the R7 and C70. And then after that, I will talk more generally about dynamic range. I have a few thoughts on testing dynamic range because I've been thinking a lot about this and I have some stuff I want to share and discuss. So we'll get onto that after talking about the tests. All right, so the only way I can really test for dynamic range is doing what's called a latitude test or a push-pull test. So I'm gonna underexpose the image and overexpose the image and see how it does and compare it with other cameras. If you've seen any of my previous videos about dynamic range, same sort of test here. So here's what I did on these cameras. The R5 I shot in 4K fine in IPB, C-Log3, ISO 800. R7 was 4K fine, IPB, C-Log3, ISO 800. The C70 was 4K XFAVC long op, C-Log2, ISO 800. Now, I know that the R5 and the C70 can shoot in RAW, but I just wanted to test it how I would use the cameras normally and probably how most people do too. So you might be able to get a little bit more dynamic range out of shooting them in RAW, but again, there's no way to test everything in one video, so this, these are the tests that I did. For both the underexposure and overexposure tests, I would use a gray card to set the exposure, and I would change the key light to get the right exposure on the gray card. So for the R5 and the R7, because I'm shooting in C-Log3, I use a 35% zebra, and the C70, which I was shooting in C-Log2, I used the false color in the camera to get the proper exposure. Now for the underexposure test, which we'll talk about here first, I did my exposure at f2.8, and then what I did was I didn't change anything, but I just stopped Drop down the aperture to give less light to the sensor. And then after I brought it into the computer, I just raised the exposure to post in post just to basically get it to match. And keep in mind, I didn't do any noise reduction in post. So the images you're seeing is just an exposure adjustment. Taking a look at these results, I am really not that surprised. I would say that the R5 and the R7 were good to about two stops under, and then they get kind of messy. Uh, it looked like the R5 held color a little bit more than the R7 once you got below two stops, but I wouldn't be really reaching down below two stops anyways to pull information out of there. The C70 was good to about three stops under. Again, not really surprising with the amazing sensor that's in that camera. Now onto the overexposure test. What I did for this one is I set the exposure, again, using the gray card with uh, zebras and false color, but I started this time at F16, and I just opened up the aperture, and then when I brought the files into the computer, I just lowered the exposure in post to try to get as much as possible. So let's take a look. Taking a look at the overexposure test here, I really wasn't that surprised. That's mainly because I've tested the R7 and the C70 and some other cameras, and so they kind of performed as I expected them to. And what I noticed was, you know, there's some issues starting to creep in at four stops over on all the cameras, and then it was unusable at five stops. So in my opinion, the overexposure test, all the cameras were pretty similar in the highlights. Now onto my conclusion about the dynamic range in the R5. I don't have a way to accurately measure the number of stops of dynamic range. You need specific tools for that, which I, again, we'll talk about later on in this video. But what I can do is look at results that have been published and sort of use my comparisons for other cameras and get an idea of you know, what we're gonna get here. So 
I'll conclude here that the R5 has around 12 stops or maybe just over 12 stops of dynamic range. It's very similar to the R7. And in my R7 dynamic range test video, which I think I said I, it got around 12 and a quarter to 12 and a half, I'd probably say it was pretty much the same as the R5. I'd probably say 12 or just over 12 stops of dynamic range. The R5 and the R7 and the C70 were very similar in the overexposure, but for the underexposure, I would say the C70 beat the R5 and the R7 by but one stop. And that camera is rated at 13 stops. So again, that puts us in that 12 or just over 12 stops of dynamic range for the R5 and the R7. Now, I was hopeful <laughs> with the firmware update because it was a pretty big firmware update that maybe we would have gotten an increase in dynamic range. I don't think that happened. When the R5C came out, it definitely had more dynamic range than the R5 and that has to, I think in part do with the cinema operating system, some sort of magic going on in there with the codex or the way that that is pulling information and putting it together. It's a little bit frustrating because they have the same sensor, but it is what it is. So <laughs> I don't think the dynamic range has been improved. Again, I don't have a R5 to compare it with the, with the old firmware, with the new firmware, and I don't have an R5C anymore to compare the R5 to the R5C. But those are my conclusions based on the stuff I've seen. In general, with the R5 and the R7, those cameras, you notice that there's a lot of room in the highlights. So when you are exposing it, make sure just not to clip the highlights. So often you can expose a little bit higher as long as you don't um, clip the highlights and maybe just a little bit under clipping, you'll get cleaner shadows. I have a video coming up real soon talking about how to expose and color grade C-Log3 footage. So keep a lookout for that. Now onto my general thoughts about dynamic range and how to test for it. Now, personally, dynamic range is one of the most important specifications and capabilities of any camera that I'm looking to purchase and use. I shoot a lot outside. I shoot in situations that have a lot of dynamic range. So if I have a camera that can capture more of that information and keep it in the camera, I'm a big fan of that. So preparing for this video, as I started to think more about testing for dynamic range, I did a lot of research and mainly had to do with testing because there, it doesn't seem like there's a clear answer to all this stuff. And that's kind of what I want to talk about here. Keep in mind, the dynamic range is the ratio of the brightest and darkest signal in one image. So you basically have to look at an image and the ratio of the brightest to the darkest, that's the dynamic range. So to accurately measure the dynamic range in terms of like getting number of stops of dynamic range, you need a tool like you've probably seen before, the Xyla 21 is one of the tools. And you've probably seen people like Cine D and Joe Lundon testing with that tool. And I don't have access to that. It'd be really cool to be able to play with it, but I don't have one. But that's pretty much the only way that I could find that's an accurate way to measure the number of stops. And we have people that are testing these cameras with that so we can use that. Now, the number of stops you get from a tool like the Xyla 21 and the Imitest software, it's great because it gives you a concrete number of stops, but it's only one metric. And I think there's more to the picture here when we're talking about dynamic range and the capabilities of a camera. Getting the number of stops is good. It's repeatable and it's scientific and it's like a baseline. We can all, you know, you can repeat it and everyone can sort of get the similar results and you can use that number to compare against what the manufacturer is, is presenting for the capabilities of the camera too. But there's other ways to look at dynamic range and sort of add into the conversation about the capabilities of the camera because that's just like a lab test. That's not looking at the actual image. That's just looking at, you know, signal, signal noise ratio and all that stuff that the computer is going to calculate. So the, I think the other part of the conversation with dynamic range and how to test for it are latitude tests. And that's what I did earlier on in this video. And really what this is, it's a way to si simulate a high dynamic range shot. So what you do here is you're wanting to look at the noise and how the color actually looks when the camera is pushed to its limit. Now, even though, you know, with dynamic range, it's that ratio of brightest to darkest in one image, even though we're not recording these clips at the same time, it kind of is since we're only, we're not changing the ISO, we're just changing the light going to the sensor by changing the aperture. So essentially this does show how the camera behaves in the shadows and the highlights. I know it's not technically in the same shot, but the only thing we're changing is how much light is getting to the sensor with the aperture. And what this does is it really shows us like what does the noise look like? What does the co colors look like in the shadows and the highlights? Because Testing for dynamic range, yes, we can get one number, but I think it's also important to take a look at what the noise looks like. Is it blocky? Is it fine? Does it change the color? Those sorts of things. And all of this together gives us a better picture and is more useful to determine the full idea of the dynamic range of a camera. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider hitting subscribe down below. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one.